Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Smartly, uh, for having us here today. Uh, I'm Peter Hodgson. Uh, I'm an interaction designer at Google. I've been working on the uh, conversational experiences at Google for about five or six years now. Um, and so in the, in the next 10 minutes, I'm just going to give you um, some of the lessons I've learned doing that and uh, observations and maybe some recommendations. Is this sounding all right to you? Because I've got a terrible echo that's going on here. I can hear myself boring myself already. So, um, but anyway, okay. okay, so quick straw poll, everybody. Hands up who is currently, or actually who has built a conversational experience this year, in the last year? Okay, so about 50%, maybe a bit more than that. That's great. So I expect a lot of you will kind of know a lot of the things I'm going to touch on today. But I hope these resonate with you. And you're probably going to hear quite a lot of these things over the next couple of days. Um, uh, and I think, I hope that's the case anyway. OK, so the first question uh, which designers and developers will ask um, when they're coming to this new is like, well, how hard can this be, right? You can talk, I can talk. It's got to be pretty simple. It's just really text, right? That's all we have to do. Uh, well, as it, as it um, turns out, of course, humans have had a lot of experience when it comes to con talking. Um, the current research says that it's actually, um, the, the time scale's been pushed out even further. They think it could be up to half a billion years, half a, 500,000 years that man, man and our predecessors have been talking. Uh, evidence says that uh, the uh, common ancestor to Neanderthals and Homo sapiens had the bone called the hyoid bone, which is in our throats, which controls the larynx and our tongue. Other primates don't have that, and that's fairly recent. So we've been doing this a long, long time, and it's been evolving all of that time. Um, but you, but, and we all here, everybody here, has been talking since before they could walk. So um, it's extremely subtle, and it's extremely hard to codify. So the key point, really, is that humans aren't going to change how they converse anytime soon. Um, and that means that uh, if we're going to do this right, we need to teach robots to speak human and not the other way around. We mustn't have it so that uh, people have to, um, uh, have to know how to speak a special spell or a new kind of language in order to interact with uh, these new technologies. In fact, um, if we do that, A, people won't do it, and B, it doesn't scale. Um, so the good news is that um, there are some really strong conversational principles which have been identified over the years by um, linguists uh, that we can use to leverage um, how we design these things. And there's just a few principles and ideas around here. So, this. so the key one, probably the most important one, um, anybody heard of the cooperative principle? Hands up. Okay, that's great. So you all know about it already. Uh, if you haven't come across it, it's really, really well worth reading about. Um, so the cooperative principle was um, identified by a, um, a philosopher of language, I didn't know there was such a thing until fairly recently, but it's pretty impressive, called Paul Grice. And these are the, he identified them, a series of maxims um, which everybody uh, who is having a conversation is unconsciously doing all the time. Um, they are that we are truthful, informative, relevant and clear. We are assuming that the other participants in the conversation are following these rules. An example of this is the maxim of quantity, and that's um, about being informative. This is the uh, understanding that when we're in a conversation, the other party is going to give us not more than or less than uh, the right amount of information to progress the conversation to the next step. So maximum of quantity, we, we also know if you're in a conversation when somebody isn't really following that, i.e. they're not saying enough or they're saying far too much, we all know people who do that, um, then it's really obvious to us. So it's a really, really useful thing to think about when you're building assistance to use these as a set of kind of parameters 
um, and things to check your designs against. You can look at them as a kind of guidelines, in a way. So if the cooperative principle is um, kind of the fuel of the conversation, it's about the fuel of the conversation, then turn-taking is the engine and the gearbox. Uh, so uh, turn-taking, uh, when we're talking to each other, is about resolving ambiguity and getting everybody back on track to the end where we can all uh, get to a, um, an agreed resolution. Um, and um, we've all, uh, linguists talk about uh, taking the turn or handing the turn um, in the conversation. And we all do this uh, in lots of ways. We do it with body language, you can do it with a look, you can do it with a, uh, changing your position, um, uh, by a hand gesture, uh, even just eye contact, can hand or take the turn um, in a conversation. Well, the assistants at the moment don't have any of that. So we have to be really, really explicit in the conversational turn taking. Um, and so when, uh, so that's the area where it becomes uh, less natural. And that's where we have to do quite a lot of work in creating really good dialogue in order to make sure that the conversation is progressed to a point um, rapidly and following the cooperative principles so we get to a resolution. Um, Okay, so straw poll. Um, uh, okay, so I'm going to ask you to hold your hands up in a minute and keep them up, um, just for a second. So who, who owns or uses a Google Home or an Amazon Alexa? Hands up. Great, that's quite a lot. Oh, keep, keep them up, keep them up. Keep your hands up if you use them mainly in your office. Right, okay. <laughs> So the point I'm making here is about context for the assistance at the moment. I think it's really, really useful. That, so if you didn't see, again, about 50 or 60%, maybe a bit more, um, have them, and about 10% using them in office. And my guess is most of the people, is a guess, uh, who are using them in their office are using them because they're developing for them a lot. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so, so when you're designing conversations, uh, for these new devices and this new platform, uh, you need to bear in mind hard, a lot, the user's physical context. What, and, and what kind of conversations are they open to in those contexts? Um, and so, uh, this is a sort of general tip, is in these early days, uh, you've got to try and look for the simple, intuitive, high-value conversations uh, which are in socially safe environments. We find generally that we're seeing that people are very comfortable to speak to uh, the Google Assistant and devices in places which are socially, socially safe. That doesn't just mean in their living rooms or in their kitchens. It also means in places outside. Um, there's a little anecdote. Um, I'm old enough to remember when mobile phones were new and uh, seeking, you know, when they were like a house brick that you would hold up against your ear. Anybody else remember that? No, you're all too young. Okay, one or two, great. We'll talk later. Um, uh, <laughs> um, so uh, there, were, there were areas which were developed. Anthropologists were studying this. There were areas outside train stations where people with these would gather quietly, a bit like smokers do in London now outside. And this was okay. It was okay to talk on your phone in that area, um, but doing it on the train or anywhere else would get a lot of frowns, and especially in London, you know, a lot of grumpy looks. Um, and I think that we're at that kind of stage with this technology. I think in the next few years, this is my opinion, um, I have no data to support it, but in my opinion, it'll become more socially acceptable over the next few years to be talking to assistants in more environments. But at the moment, you need to look at places where it's socially safe, and where uh, voice has less friction than touch. And there's plenty of opportunities, but it's a really interesting thing to look at. OK, so this is a must. OK. Um, you need to design your persona, uh, the brand persona. Uh, it's not a nice to have, in my view, as a designer. It's a must. Um, 
Uh, humans can identify or uh, imagine or picture um, another person by uh, listening to their voice and what they're saying in a matter of seconds, literally. We already have a picture in our mind of the person we're talking to when we hear them. And we can identify, the research is amazing on this, you can identify someone's height, their weight, even their sexual preference just from listening to them on the, on the, on the, listening to the audio track. So the point is, as my uh, colleague James Giangola, uh, you should read his book if you haven't, it's brilliant. Um, uh, he says, if you don't design your brand persona, your users will. So they will identify some characteristics. So there's a brilliant opportunity for us to make sure that they don't get the wrong personality. Anyone remember the beginnings of uh, uh, when Siri first came out? There was a whole load of stuff about how she was snarky and all of those sorts of things. I don't think that's necessarily true. But I think Apple, and this is again my opinion, I think Apple were trying at that moment to be quite neutral about their, their, their brand persona. And, um, and I, think that's what, I think that's why you were hearing those things. So it's better to be positive about it than it is to be sort of try and be uh, all things to all men. Um, but the other thing is that um, it's a style template. So that's another way I think of it as a designer. Um, if you create a backstory for your character, your persona, you, who are they? What do they like? What are their hobbies? Um, how does he say hello in the morning? Uh, how might uh, she say, uh, uh, how might she offer you some things? The, the, how they say something depends a lot on who they are. So write the backstory. It's amazingly useful as a framework. And also describe to yourselves the job to be done, the role that this persona is taking for your brand. Um, if you've got that and you've got it documented, it's a point of reference for everybody. So I'm not saying you have to announce to the world, this is, you know, Bob, our brilliant new virtual assistant. You don't have to do that. But having it internally means that it makes your own, con your own ability to construct these personas and these conversations much easier. It becomes something that everyone can look to and which you can use as a guideline for everybody. You can say, that doesn't meet the persona. We should, does it? And you can have a discussion about it. So it's a really, really useful thing to do. Um, another must do, okay. This same seems obvious, and this is not really a great picture, but I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, sorry, I'm aware that I'm probably running quite long, so uh, I'll try and hurry up. Start with the dialogue, okay. <laughs> no matter what the platform you're thinking of deploying on, the dialogue and the conversation is, is all. And it, again, it provides um, the start point. Uh, for everything. So before you start building anything, think about the dialogue. You create sample dialogues for the for the most likely use cases, and the, and draw, and draw write them end to end. But the most important thing, which this doesn't show very well, is you need to speak them. You need to talk them out loud. Talk to the, your colleagues about them. Act them out with each other. It's amazingly useful, and it's and it shows you where your dialogue goes wrong. So written dialogue and spoken dialogue are almost completely different things. You think they're the same, but they're not. You'll write this and you'll then speak it and you go, oh, that doesn't sound right. And why is that? Oh, it's because it's not how we say things. We don't say things how they're written. Uh, script writers are obviously much, much better and aware of this. So anybody who's got script writing experience is usually massively useful um, in the team. Um, and the other thing is, if you're presenting dialogue to anybody else, to shareholders, try, and it's hard sometimes, but try and present it in the audio channel. So don't go, you know, here's a whole load of words. This is what the character's going to say. This is what my assistant's going to say. Play it as an audio file. It's amazingly useful. Um, and after you've nailed the, um, oh, yeah, OK, next slide. <laughs> OK, this is a talk in itself, right? Repair strategies in dialogue. Um, so uh, enough to say that after you've done your sample dialogues, and forgive me if I am um, teach you all how to suck eggs here. I apologize if that's the case. But um, I can't emphasize this enough. Uh, historically, uh, people don't like voice interfaces, uh, generally IVR systems, 
because when they go off t off tack, when there's a there's a mistake or an error, it, people feel it's their fault. Sixty percent of people think they either feel angry or confused, or or generally um, uh, they bl awkward. They blame themselves. And the good news is that 62% of that same group will give it another go, but you have to make sure that the repair strategies that you've got in place are going to get them back on track. So there's a really big opportunity to get people back on track and to rebuild their trust um, and to build empathy with them. So if you can repair the conversations well, then you're going to be in a much, much better place uh, than if the assistant keeps asking for the same things, those sorts of things. So the other thing, that's another key point, is the assistance that we're building should be forgiven. Two minutes. OK, right. OK, I'm going to miss the last few slides. How long have you been saying two minutes? Sorry. OK. <laughs> um, OK. Um, assistance should be forgiving. OK. People make mistakes. That's OK. Um, and we need to make sure that our systems allow for that um, and be highly focused on getting them back on track. OK. I'm going to run out of time. Think cross-platform. OK, uh, design your, your uh, conversations. I'm trying not to read my notes now. Uh, design your conversations across modalities. Um, the conversational logic may have to change depending on the surface that you're uh, deploying on. It's much, much different dialogue structure for presenting a list of choices on an eyes-free surface to one where you can show a list of things for people to touch and pick from. So you need to be aware that your same conversations may be different across different surfaces. Um, I think multimodal is probably the hardest uh, of these surfaces to, to work on, um, uh, partly because we all understand touch UX. Um, we all understand the, the, the patterns are there. It's extremely easy now to build, compared to what it was uh, five years ago or so, to build uh, mobile apps. We have patterns. We have an ex uh, expectation of how these things work. But um, in, in the multimodal world, the screen is one output. It's one channel um, of the communication of the information transfer. OK, I'm going to have to skip. Um, I apologize for having to do this. This is one thing, one th rule of thumb. I'll just do this quickly, see if it works. OK, so uh, this is a rule of thumb. Don't have the same information on the screen as you do when you're reading, because voice is linear, and listening to it and understanding the audio channel can be slow. So don't make your assistant, that's me, read everything on the screen, because your users can scan it and pause it before the assistant has finished speaking it aloud. See what I mean? Did that work? No. OK, right, next. <laughs> Promise there's just two things, two more points. Okay. Uh, um, what am I going to say here? Uh, okay, the first conversation is always different from the second conversation, and probably the third. Uh, we expect when we're having conversation with someone that they'll remember us to some degree, and we expect, we should expect that our users expect assistants to know them when they come back. Now, this is hard at the moment, but there's some very simple tracking things that you can do, which will give the people the perception that the assistant is more intelligent than a particularly fixed state chart or state diagram might, might indicate. So there's that. And then the second point on this is personalization. I think this is probably the biggest single opportunity. We're on the threshold where uh, we will be able to personalize interactions for millions of users. And I think that is an extraordinary position to be in. It's really, really exciting. Um, we're not there yet, as uh, Lionel was saying. It's very, very early days, but we're nearly there. So finally, OK, back to what Lionel had to say. Uh, it's 10 years since the iPhone, almost to the month, eight years since the iPad. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, it's a brilliant picture, isn't it? Uh, we all know, we all know, uh, we've all seen uh, toddlers who swipe TV screens. I've seen them, pictures of them, long pressing pictures in books, going, oh, this is stupid. What the hell's going on here, right? In 10 years' time, there will be a generation of people who can't imagine not talking to their technology. I think that's absolutely amazing and with what Lionel was just saying at the end of this year there will be 400 million 
Google Assistant enabled devices across the globe. That's now. So where we'll be in 10 years' time is really, really exciting. And that's why I'm a designer in the space, because it's so exciting. And I hope you're excited as well. Thank you very much. Appreciate the time.